And I tried to, what is the definition of a developing country? It didn't exist. I started a course in global health in our undergraduate program and found out that the student always discussed the world in the breaks when I listen in the terms of we and them. How will the world develop? Can they live like us? And the most common statement by Swedish students from 1993 and onwards has been, they cannot live like us, that would never work. It's like a prayer. Lord's Prayer is not well known any longer in Sweden, but this everyone repeats. And then comes the second line, which is even more well known. All Chinese cannot have a car. <laughs> is that not said in Britain? All Chinese cannot have, and you don't have any car factories anymore. So, uh, so all Chinese cannot have a car. And I think they heard that in Beijing, don't you? <laughs> they got annoyed, and when they had money, the first thing they did, they bought the Volvo company. <laughs> and it's quite interesting. And that was a defining moment in Sweden, when China bought the Volvo company. And the even more was to happen afterward. They hired engineers in Gothenburg. Whereas the Dutch guy who bought Saab is failing. So if you want to be bought by someone, see that it's not the West European. You know, try to have an Asian that buy your company. Eh? And they, I asked them what they said. They said, this is a Western world and developing world. And they, well, the students have over the years told about this thematic day they had in primary school or in secondary school. They said the teacher, the teacher wrote Western world on one wall and, and a developing world on the other. And we spent the morning cutting out images and putting on the walls. And I vividly remember one, one young student said, she said that, that, that the Western world, you know, the Western world, that was father and mother packing the car with two kids going to the beach for a holiday. And developing world that was father and mother and six siblings without shoes crying on the graveyard because the little sister had died in diarrhea and malnutrition. That's how I, that's when I grasped the world, when I saw that. And that's impressive. The Swedish school system has really managed to communicate the disparity between the best of and the worst of. That has succeeded. But, but to manage to explain what may be in between has failed completely. So I started to provocate the students. I said, what is the definition? And they said, long life in small family, short life in large family. <laughs> and this is good, because this is obviously our pet indicator, isn't it? You know, life expectancy and fertility rate. And that's where we started, or my son and his wife and a small team started to make this software that became so popular. You know, where each country is a bubble, the size of the bubble is population, you choose size here. This is China, this is India, and on this axis, family size, small families, large families. Here, length of life, short life, and long life. And the students were right, wasn't they? Two types of countries. Developing world, large family, short life. Western world, small family, long life. It's just that this was 1950. The worldview I have found in Swedish students correspond to reality of the year their teachers were born. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rare mirror driving. It's like looking in the rare mirror when you're driving. Because things have changed. And this is, this is my most popular animation. You may have seen it, seen it on the internet. I can expand that further and then then I take down the speed. What has happened since 1950? Let's go a little slow first. Not so much happened here. Life gets a little longer. That was Mao Zedong. Can you see Mao Zedong's great leap forward? <laughs> oh, don't laugh. It was a tragedy. It was a tragedy. 68. 68. That's when Paul Ehrlich wrote the book, The Population Bomb. He was so concerned. He said, look, these countries have got a little longer life expectancy now. Child mortality has fallen, but they still have large families. There's going to be an explosion of people. And, 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 and children with, with, with different uh, degrees of black pigmentation of their skin was portrayed as bombs of terrorists. I think it's very, very bad. Never, ever use the word population explosion. It means that you think they are terrorists when they get loved children. It's a very nasty way of putting it, you know? But it worked in the media. Now, 
But he was right that we were to see we had 3.5 billion people in the world 1968. And he was right when he said we will be 7 billion before I die. And we are 7 billion this year and he hasn't died yet. <laughs> That's part of the reason why we are 7 billion. <laughs> So what happened? Look here. Have they got smaller families? What has happened? We start there. Ready, steady, go. Here we go. Can you see China is applying family planning? They are moving over very fast there. India is trying to follow there. Indonesia is fast. The Bangladesh is coming up. The Muslims are going quite way. <laughs> here. The HIV tragedy takes them down in life expectancy. But the world is there today. <laughs> Completely different world. And this fertility rate is one of the best number we have. Many of you have done surveys, you know, you, you, you come and disturb people in a rural area or an urban slum and you want them to tell things. But asking how big the family is is very simple. You go up to the door, knock the door, the door swing open, kids come out to see who it is and you count them. One. <laughs> People discuss the data we have from low-income countries, from middle-income countries, if it's reliable or not. It's not a question of whether it's reliable in that country or not. It's what type of data it is. Size of population we know fairly well. There is some, some, some shakiness on Nigerian census. Not because they can't do census, because there's a lot of political tension around, around the censuses. Yeah? A fertility rate we know surprisingly well. Life expectancy is much weaker. Large uncertainty because the data I'm showing you, the data we use, are not registration. It's not reported birth or death. It is censuses and quite cunning and, and clever surveys that are done based on censuses. So this is more or less where we are up up in that corner. And and um, you can see what what I always used to say is the surprising surprising change of the world. How many have come up there? And I hear many still attribute China's move here to Mao Zedong and his one-child policy. But then it's interesting to know that there's one part of mainland China where Mao Zedong didn't reach. Which one was that? Not Taiwan, mainland. It's Hong Kong. How many children per woman do they have in Hong Kong? 1.01. There's something much more powerful in the bedroom than Mao Zedong. <laughs> There's something much, much more powerful there. Huh? And the Americans have this nice expression which they call pillow talk. When the young couple starts to talk before, during, and after making love, then something happens in the world. Huh? When, when, when there are no talking, you have patriarchal biological sex, this is what you get. Now, this is not the whole of Afghanistan. There's quite a substantial part of Afghanistan with highly educated people which are very capable. Eh? But there are a large part of Afghanistan where people haven't had possibility to go to work, uh, to go to school and so on. So the average here is based on one subset of Afghanistan being here and a huge part of Afghanistan being down there. Eh? This is the situation. But, but if I, if I allow myself to be very simplistic, it's patriarchal sex over there, whereas here it is pillow talk. Yeah? <laughs> the young couple reach for a condom, they reach for a pill, and they say we shall have two children only. We also want to go to the beach on holiday. We want to buy a guitar, we want to have shoes on our kids, we want them to go to school, we'll fight this life for our children. <clears throat> this has happened. The world is full of modern families, full of modern families up here. And what is it then, what is it then we have? Eh? Uh, the number of, of births per year. Everyone hear about population growth and it's coming up now, 31st of October. It's going to be a lot of fuss about it. Now we are 7 billion. 14 years ago we were 6 billion. It's going to be 8 billion. And the environmentalists are going to go wild and say, stop, we have to stop on this level. We don't want any more people. They are proposing a new holocaust. It's very serious, because there's no way we can avoid becoming two billions more if we are not going to kill people. No way. And I will explain why. Because we start to look at the number of children born. 1960, 90 million. We know it quite well, plus minus 5 to 10 million. 
That's my answer. Don't get carried away that we, they are not precise. The range is more or less there. It increased. 1990, that increased to 135 million. Question is, what is it now, 20 years later? Is it 135, 150, 165? This means same growth rate. This is slower growth rate. This is no growth rate of the number of births per year in the world, which is the absolutely defining number. It is 135. The number of births per year stopped growing 20 years ago, and it has been on the United Nations webpage all the time, and no one has taken notice. This is the stuff I lecture about. To make life easy, I don't take these advanced things I saw that your research group were doing like this. You're working very hard, doing complicated things. You, Linus, who is here from our department, he took the whole, whole mobile cell phone data from Haiti, advanced stuff. I'm, I'm more clever. I, <laughs> they work very hard. I, what is it that people absolutely doesn't know? I start there. What is it they have missed, huh? which we have good data for? And then I find that out, and then I teach about that. It's a very relaxed life, I suppose. <laughs> I try to fight the unnecessary ignorance, and this is one of them. So there is no longer any world population growth. It's only a world adult population growth. The number of children stopped growing in 2005. We had 2 billion kids below, below 15 years of age, and the forecast from the United Nations doesn't expect that to change. How does it look then? Then we have to do a tool of that. Look here. I'm going to show this here. We have, we have the population pyramid show men in one direction, women in another. We did something very, uh, very nasty. We put them together. Normally, you're not allowed to do that, you know? <laughs> you have to split whenever you can. We did the other way around, because the population pyramid is sort of difficult, you know? It's like a tennis match. <laughs> you have to watch both ways, and as you said, it's very interesting. You can find these differences. But to get the, the big picture, we put them together. In 1968, when Paul Ehrens wrote the book, there were indeed very many kids. The one below five were more than the one between five and ten, and there were more. There was this sort of pyramid shape, you know? And, and look what happened, look what happened. Look at the lower bar as I let the year pass on here. I let the year pass here. Eh? And, and you can see that we have the lower bar is just increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing, then it stops. Then the next one stops five years later, and the next one stops there. And then this stops there. There will be a little more kids there. But basically, this is more, more or less, there will be some more there but then it will stop, stop somewhere, somewhere like this. And, and the big picture is, where are the coming two billion? It's this area. This area that is empty is going to be filled up. So those who are going to constitute those two billions, they are already born. If you don't like them, you have to kill them. <laughs> Which is not allowed. And he's not allowed to deny the Holocaust, the terrible Holocaust that took place. And he shouldn't be allowed to propose new ones either. We have to plan for 9 billion in this world. There's no other way we can do it. Huh? This is what we expect. Let me, let me go back a little here, and I change this to 15-year to groups. 15-year huh? groups, it increased like this, you see? Then they stop, that stop. Can you see which is the most successful age group in the world? Can you see what the future below? It's me, 60 plus. <laughs> it's boring, isn't it? I think I could panic almost. <laughs> because this is what has happened. This is what has happened in Britain. What has happened in Sweden is going to happen in the world. What's strange with that? It's strange with that. That means that it's not because of longer life expectancy that the world population will grow. It's just because these, po these groups, eh, 2011, these two generations here are going to replace generations that were fewer when they were born. There's 135 million born and only 8 million dies. But there are 45 million induced abortion per year. In fact, the number of induced abortions in the world per year is almost equal to the number of adult deaths. <coughs> There's some amazing figures when you sit down and you, you just relax and try to get the bigger picture. 
That means that we have abortions now at an enormous rate. And, and, and luckily, we can see that these gender-specific abortions are fading away in the more developed part of India, the more developed part of Asia. But they are not fading away because the female fetus is, is not aborted. It is because the abortion of male fetuses are catching up. And there's no way Sweden have. How old were you in school when you saw the condom the first time, Linus? <laughs> <laughs> 13. Eh? 13. 13. Oh, then he escaped it. When the school is eight years in this, we, we try to do four puberties. We are very active. We have 100,000 births, we need 25,000 abortions. 